If you're looking for proven ways to take your fundraising results to the next level, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, hosted by Tammy Zonker. Tammy has trained and led thousands of nonprofit organizations to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars and is also recognized as one of America's top 20 fundraising experts. This is the podcast where Tammy equips and empowers amazing fundraising pros like you to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now, let's hear from Tammy. We'll start the show in a moment after a word from a few amazing fundraisers about what they value most as members of Tammy Zonker's Fundraising Transformers community. I have had the honor of learning and growing from Tammy. She has really helped us understand how to communicate better with our donors, how to make sure that our mission is at the front line of their decision making. And she has just been an absolute joy to learn from. That's Stevie Shoemate from Chapters Health Foundation in Tampa, talking about how being a growth member is helping her communicate better with her donors. When you join Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community as a growth member, you get live training and coaching with Tammy twice each month. You can get your burning questions answered during her live Ask Me Anything sessions. You get to join in Tammy's live weekly hot topic discussions. You can engage with other fundraising pros like you and her private and safe online community. And you get 24-7 access to her growing library of on-demand fundraising training videos and tools. Here's Jenna Sapluski from the Coalition for Children, Youth, and Families in Milwaukee talking about how being a growth member in Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community is helping her grow her capacity, her skills, and her confidence as a fundraiser. It's been so helpful for me to grow my capacity and my skills. I feel more confident uh, knowing that I have Tammy and the Fundraising Transformers group for support. I've reached out to Tammy and the group on several occasions, whether it be just some wording for an email to say, hey, can somebody give me just a little bit of feedback on this? I'd love your thoughts before I send this out for an initiative. We'll hear more later in the show about why Jenna values having access to Tammy's members-only on-demand training library. To learn more about the Fundraising Transformers community, visit fundraisingtransformed.com forward slash growth. Today on the Intentional Fundraiser podcast, I'm talking with Daryl Upsall. Daryl is the president of Daryl Upsall International Consulting and Daryl Upsall International Recruitment. He's been working in the nonprofit sector for nearly 40 years. He and his team work with more than 300 organizations worldwide. They have successfully completed 742 nonprofit executive searches for more than 260 organizations in 129 locations worldwide. Wide organizations like World Wildlife Fund, Oxfam, Greenpeace, UNICEF, Amnesty International. The very impressive list goes on and on and on. And Daryl lives in beautiful Madrid, Spain. And as a side note, he is an amazing foodie and chef. So, Daryl, my first question for you is when are you and Miriam inviting us over for dinner? <laughs> 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 oh, there's a, about a month waiting list, and uh, no, we, we love I, to cook and eat, and uh, oh, I'm enjoying all the fantastic produce here in Spain. As well. Fantastic. So, Daryl, welcome to the show. Pleasure to, it, it, to join you, Tammy. Oh, thank you. Well, seriously, for us, it is such an honor to have you here, and always a delight to talk with you. So, shall we jump into some questions? Yeah, let's go for it. Awesome. Why don't you share with us how you got your start in fundraising? Sure. I think as a, as a child, I was a kind of entrepreneur. I always found little ways of making some money, selling something that somebody else had maybe thrown away, and then I would find a purpose for it. And I think that led to me being what I'd call a natural-born fundraiser. <laughs> so at high school, I formed a pop band. I couldn't sing. I couldn't drum. I couldn't play the guitar. So I became the manager. <laughs> and the first concerts were to raise money for a cancer care unit. 
I should go on That's to say, it. by the way, two members of the band went to found a record label of which Oasis was one of their bands. So, wow, a pretty successful start. Yeah, I guess so. And so and did you. Even, even a movie made of them. <laughs> you well, I did. I, I I actually ended up in the music world quite a lot. So that was a good start. But then I was at Cambridge at the university, and in English students student uh, life, you have a, a fundraising week, and I became the president of that. I became involved in politics and very much in progressive causes. And I guess one of the things I learned very quickly is progressive causes have the least money. <laughs> hmm. Everybody's willing to talk, not many when he, many people were willing to raise the funds. So I jumped in and raised the funds. Incredible. And That's I am I seeing some some really common themes and threads that we could pull through. I mean, messaging, advocacy, inspiring people to action, which certainly music does. And I think that, you know, music moves people. And we all know that yep. nothing happens until somebody feels something in fundraising. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I was driven by passion, and I think music creates passion. Causes create passion. I've been lucky enough to work in development issues, women's rights issues, HIV AIDS, Greenpeace and the environment issues as an employee, as it were. And you can't work for those without being passionate. And I think when you're passionate, mm. that fuels your fundraising. Absolutely. I could not agree more. So, Daryl, you have really built this nearly 40-year career in international fundraising, consulting, and recruitment. And so I consider you the expert on what it means to work in the international space. So I, I want you to kind of expound, if you would, from your point of view, what does it really mean to go international with your fundraising career? It's a good question, and I think it means different things for different people. You could be working for Save the Children in the USA, for example, and there you're working internationally. You're raising money for an international cause, supporting children, families around the world. And that is international fundraising in a certain sense. Another sense, and I'd say more related to the way I work and my colleagues at Darrell Upsell International work, we're raising funds and helping people raise funds all over the world. So even if I take Save the Children, Save the Children is present in many, many countries, but if they want to enter... Uh, Mongolia, or they want to evaluate their fundraising in South Korea, that's what we do. But I would say to really, as an organization, to, rate, to be international, it means you need to be raising funds in more than one country. If you're a fundraiser who's working international, I think you need to be working across more than one country. Interesting distinction. I think that uh, all of my fundraising experience has been you know, based in the U.S., working for causes that are that are delivering mission, changing lives in the U.S. But I have worked with clients who are U.S. based or headquartered, raising funds locally and abroad to serve missions locally and abroad. And I think that one of the challenges that they uh, often encounter is, you know, for my U.S.-based donors, how do I take them to the mission? I mean, occasionally they will, uh, some of major donors, individuals who have the deepest levels of commitment or wealth that can actually, you know, fly to have an immersive experience or to see the work live and in person. But I think those are the exceptions. So over the many years you've worked with groups in that situation, what have been some of the more inspiring ways that you've been able to, that they've been able to take the donor to the scene, so to speak? Great question. And, and if I go back to my beginnings of time, which were in the early mid 80s, what would often happen is we would bring beneficiaries from the countries where we're working and have them speak to church groups, have them speak to women's organizations, have them share their experience of what life is in Nicaragua, or Salvador, or Guatemala, which was the region I started really working in and with. Or there would be volunteer brigades doing work out there. Interestingly, my, my uh, Spanish nieces, niece and nephew, have just come back from Africa where they've spent three weeks working on a project in Senegal. 
and they're mm. landing back today. And I'm sure they're going to be full of stories. And that storytelling from the field, be it field workers or volunteers or beneficiaries, is immensely emotional. And in the old days, you would have a slideshow, you know, those machines which go sure. click, 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 and you, you, you do a... Um, <laughs> trying to think of what you call it, like a round thing with, with all the images. But that's yes. powerful. Today, I think it's amazing what we can do. I've always been a big fan of MSF and worked with them, again, all over the world. And MSF, Canada, probably going back now 15 years, or well, whenever it was Skype came out, started doing live broadcasts through Skype and inviting people to join their doctors in the field, it could be South Sudan, it could be post-tsunami or whatever, and you could see and hear through your uh, Skype, mostly then on, on a desktop computer or a laptop, telling what was going on, moving around with the camera in their, their phone or, or their laptop and showing actually the scene around them. And you could do Q&A. And I've got to admit... Yeah, that brought me very close. And now what's happening is people are using you know, WhatsApp, for example. In Spain, I think we have 120% usage of WhatsApp. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're my, my mother's, my <laughs> wife's mother, who's eight, six, she's on WhatsApp all day, sending messages or little video clips. On. And again, people are doing WhatsApp broadcasts from the field, recording and sending to groups. And what I've heard really interestingly, is now there are quite a few major donor WhatsApp groups. So if you're really? in a kind of group of, say, maybe five or ten very wealthy individuals, and you're giving significantly to a project and it's overseas-based, you can put those six people into a WhatsApp group and have a report from the field, a report from the CEO, a little video from the uh, a beneficiary telling them the work that they have enabled through their gift. So I think technology brings us all closer. And in these times mm. when we've been used to using these such tools, um, they're great for bringing you close to a mission. I love that. And certainly we've seen how the use of video can really help bring the mission to our supporters. But this idea of using WhatsApp, uh, I think, is really profound in a couple of ways. One, it is live. They can join uh, and see the work, of course. But two, you know, they're in that, it feels like a very private kind of protected group. So it gives that sense of privacy, a specialness. Yeah. And certainly it provides, it like feeds that psychological principle of social proof, right? I'm here with yeah. other peers, peer philanthropists. So my interest, my commitment to this uh, is affirmed by these other respected yeah. folks. Yeah. It's almost like a donor advice group living within what a donor advice group living with or donor advice fund living within WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is, it. you know, you could end that little broadcast from the, the nonprofit in question who's helping their story be told and thanking the beneficiaries, the, the donors. But then the donors can themselves choose to have a chat and say, hey guys, what did you think about that? I thought that mm. was awesome. I think they deserve more support. Yeah. So in a sense, they can reinforce each other, but within the privacy of a WhatsApp group. I think that is a, a real strategy and tool that most of our listeners, whether you're, you know, whether you're doing international work or whether you're even doing local, regional or national work, but you've got donors all across the country or alumni. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that, that's a I mean, great takeaway. I worked in HIV AIDS in the very early years and, and even... Yeah, how do you tell the story of HIV AIDS when people were even afraid to be in a room with somebody with HIV AIDS? Uh, I had a board of 12, 13 people, 12 died in three years. That was my board. Mm. But we were having their stories being told, their, their life. You know, John, a former head teacher, is the board chair. He's living with AIDS for AIDS. But having their story and them verbalizing, we were very early on at just even just getting a a sound archive, if you like, and telling their story. And it was very powerful when you played it to donors. And then you say, well, sadly, John's no longer with us, but he's left a message for you as a donor to thank you. Mm. Powerful stuff. Very powerful. <laughs> wow. Wow. Love it. I love it. So, of course, there's a conversation about making certain that we aren't exploitive 
in our storytelling or showcasing through the use of video or images or, you know, there's been some criticism more recently emerging about even when and how to use testimonials or how, when and how to use mission tours. You know, it's just so important that we equip and empower both fundraisers and those we serve to tell their story in a way that empowers them, doesn't make them feel exploited or taken advantage of, or any unhealthy power dynamics. What are your thoughts on that? What are you seeing from an international perspective? It's interesting. This debate has been going on since even before I started, from the late 1970s, especially in development nonprofits. Uh, and there was the whole discussion, and it's, the shorthand is flies in eyes. If you show mm -hmm. children with flies in their eyes in sub-Saharan Africa starving, it hits the emotional buttons every time. But it's exploitative. And the child is always the victim. The mother is always the victim holding the child. And I think, well, for a start, the big development brands that you mentioned many of previously signed an agreement in the 1980s that they would not use this. Many did not actually go along uh, and sign, but some did. But more and more, that there needed to be an alternative. So the alternative was in the words of what this means. Tell your life story. And most people in terrible situations, they weren't born into a terrible situation. The situation has come upon them because of either war, famine, man-made issues like global climate change, and they are living with it. But they have a story to tell. Interesting, I'm reading a novel right now from Ken Follett, and it starts off very much in this situation in Africa, in a dried-up lake. And there's a character there, and the woman is telling her story and telling how it was different and can be different. And I think that's where we've moved to. And I think the other area that's changed greatly is the use of children images. We have to be very, very careful using child images. And, and most organizations in development now are very wary as well of not having two sets of values. In Europe, it would be banned to show a beneficiary child image. But guess what? That child in Africa isn't protected by the same legislation. So I think there's a, a bit of a debate there about, okay, if it's good for the children in our countries not to be exposed, which has implications by certain people who, who may use those images in a, in a not too healthy way, why is it okay for children from the global south to be exposed? So there's lots to be said. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, I was in HIV AIDS that time when the man dying in bed looking like Christ uh, was taken by the uh, famous Italian photographer. And there were protests by WhatsApp, groups protesting about the use of such images. Two years later, that image was being celebrated by the same groups because it was a true story. It told a reality and it woke people up to the need of love, care, and affection for people mm. living and in those days dying with AIDS. So healthy debate that needs to be had constantly. I, was I and totally absolutely agree. Not white saviors. Please, white saviors in uniform saving black people, get rid of it. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, that is a whole other chapter in this book of ethical fundraising and ethical storytelling for absolutely. sure. You know, one of the tools that I came across as I was exploring this was the DOCUS Code of Conduct coming out of Ireland. And essentially, yeah. its principles are, you know, respect for the dignity of the people concerned, belief in the equality of all people, acceptance of the need to promote fairness, solidarity, and justice. And then it goes into details about, you know, how do we empower and honor the person who is being served, right? The, yep. um, the recipient in a way that they have complete control over their story, how it's told and where it's told and when it's told and for how long it's told. And essentially the bottom line is that consent is more than a signed document, <laughs> right? Absolutely. It's an ongoing conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, wow. I also have to say there are some organizations that were using images of starving children in Africa long after that child had died, and in some cases long after the child who was presented as a two-year-old was 20 years old. Mm. And that same person is 20 years old living in the world, 
And yet the world is seeing their image as a two-year-old in a, in a very bad situation. It's not respect. It's, yeah. But it's a conversation. I think we'll constantly change on that. It's a bit like showing same-sex relationships, which were never shown before, but have always been a reality. And I would say oh, the whole issue of uh, diversity and inclusion in images has definitely been impacted on uh, how we present our organizations in these years. Yeah, such an important conversation. And as you said, one that we that's continually evolving and that we all have to really, as fundraisers, commit ourselves to staying up to date, to educating ourselves, to asking questions and understanding and and for all of us to be kind of in the space where we don't attack one another in those conversations yeah. because we are all trying to learn and do better. I don't know who said it, but the, the saying was when you know better, do better. And yeah. I and I think that's that's at the core of this conversation. Yeah. So good. And and I also see <laughs> Well, one of the challenges also is, is it's, a, it's a fast evolving world. You know, poor countries cannot be said. The global south, is that politically correct now or not? Or is it you know, developing countries? Well, developed in, by whose standards? So I think, again, we're always very, very mindful in our organization when working with clients is the language with which you use is very important because... All language is weighted and colored, I would say. Yes. And isn't that an interesting dynamic, especially in the space of international fundraising? Because language, meanings of words, cultural dynamics, like there's a lot to understand when you're trying to engage uh, potential supporters or current supporters to, you know, support a cause. So... We're back with growth member Jenna Zapluski from the Coalition for Children, Youth, and Families in Milwaukee talking about how having 24-7 access to Tammy Zonker's on-demand training library is helping her become a better fundraiser. Since joining the Fundraising Transformers group, I have had the opportunity to go back and re-watch a host of trainings on such a wide variety of topics from how to work with my team members inside my organization to how to get my board excited and passionate about fundraising and topics like how to reach out to a donor and how to get a meeting with a donor. Here's Stevie Shoemate from Chapters Health Foundation in Tampa, sharing that as a growth member in Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community, you're never alone. How members of the community support one another by sharing resources and lessons learned to help solve tough fundraising problems. You oftentimes learn from other people across the entire country, which is really nice because it helps you understand that you're not alone in your uh, fundraising challenges. It, um, I was just sharing with someone the other day that it really helped me feel like I wasn't the only one experiencing these challenges, knowing that someone from New York or New Hampshire or Texas, um, people all over the US with varying communities and different fundraising strategies, we're all in this together. At the end of the show, we'll hear why members enjoy learning from Tammy and what you can expect when you join as a growth member in her Fundraising Transformers community. To learn more about the Fundraising Transformers community, visit fundraisingtransformed.com forward slash growth. I'd love to have you share if there's a fundraiser out there, whether they're new to the profession or seasoned or kind of mid-career, and they're thinking, gosh, intern, there's a lure, there's a calling for me to explore going international, doing international fundraising. So what does that look like as someone who might be wanting to go international? And I've heard you talk about having an international mindset. So unpack that for us. Tell us what that means. It's interesting. Sometimes it even starts when you're very young. The first thing I did when I was 15, 16 was hitchhiked around Europe. Hitchhiked. You could do it in those days. <laughs> At 18, I hitchhiked around the United States and Mexico, much to the horror of my parents. But I think the first thing is, if you want to work internationally, 
you've got to be able to go outside your own community. And that is not just geographical community, but to get to meet, visit, spend time with other communities. I managed when I was 20, I think I was, to spend four months in India. And the biggest welcomes, I must say, me and my, my friend traveling together, got with some of the poorest Indian families who took us into their home and shared a dal and a bread with us and their family. And that was a big deal, but it gave us insights into their heart, their generosity, and made us recognize where we were coming from and that benefit. So I think there was a phrase I used to use always. If you're going to work internationally, you've got to be able to smell the dirt. Mm. And by that, I mean, you've got to, the dirt of Africa smells differently to the dirt of New York. The the sound of New Delhi is very different to the sound of New York the, or New Orleans. And, and if you go there, you experience it. And then you start to understand more of the lives that people are living. And especially if you don't go you know, deluxe version and you're staying in a modest way. The other thing I would say is, and I'm bad at this, but learn languages. You know, my wife speaks five languages. My son speaks three fluently. I also am told I speak about one and a half, Spanish being my <laughs> half. But again, by listening to people, you get nuances in, into things. And I would say simple things like if you only look at your local newspaper, you won't even know what's going on nationally. So listen to national, listen to international broadcasts. In the U.S., listen to PBS. You know, I love listening to public service broadcast radio in the USA because you get, as you do with the BBC, broadcasts from around the world, rebroadcast. Donate to an international non-profit outside of your country. You can do it easily and see what messages they give you. There's, there's so much you can do that make you get a sense of looking outwards and hearing from outside before you go into it. And I think mm. there's some of the tips I would definitely, recommend people do because sometimes when you know somebody's maybe worked only in one city or one state and they say i want an international career and i go okay so what's international about your life right now and it could even great start question the it could start with food i love indian yeah. food or i love thai food. well speak to the owner of the thai restaurant ask a little bit about their life oh that's interesting I think that's such incredible advice, you know, because it's, even when you describe it, Daryl, about smell the dirt, the dirt in in Africa smells different than the dirt in New York. And the, so when you describe it that way and you talk about it, it sounds so romantic, right? So uh, eat, love, pray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, You've yeah. seen that movie. I've been to yes. Bali. I've been to Bali. I know where. <laughs> even the where it was written. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so I love that you like lean into that when a fundraiser who's working with you, maybe help seeking your support in finding an international position that you kind of lean in and make certain that they really understand what they might be signing up for because it goes back to language, right? What does international, I love international spaces and places like what does that mean to you so I think that's really great advice so what are some of the key things so you talked about learned languages what I'm hearing in the way you describe going international is that there needs to be just a natural curiosity about other spaces of love of different cultures from modest authentic to, you know, again, in any culture, there's typically a range and you have to be comfortable and enjoy exploring all of it. Because I think that's what we do as fundraisers. We kind of connect in so many cases, not every nonprofit, but in so many um, cases, we're connecting great basic needs, whether those are, you know, food, access to health care, or war or environment, like critical needs to, to supporters who are passionate about that and have the capacity to make a difference, to invest in it, to help transform it. So that's, you, we do kind of live in two worlds. Yeah. And, and it's interesting as well. I mean, some people are very difficult to go outside their comfort zone. I, when I worked for Greenpeace, I remember one colleague who was San Francisco 
based originally, but was in Amsterdam where our headquarters was, and was struggling to even acclimatize not just to the weather in Amsterdam, but I can't get the same bagels. I can't get the same <laughs> grind of coffee that I would get. It's, and I'm thinking, well, don't even try. Have a Dutch yes. waffle. Have a pancake. Try their coffee. They were making coffee way before there was grinding any coffee in San Francisco. And remember, you know, New York is New Amsterdam. So Peter Stuyvesant <laughs> came from Holland. So in a sense, you've got to throw away a little bit of, of your inhibitions and what you are to be able to absorb a little bit of more of where you are. And I certainly, when I work in a country like China, which you know, is, I've had the joy of speaking at conferences there and having clients there, it's a totally different mindset and world. But it's joyous. And especially if you're open to everything, you might not like everything that gets put on your plate, even me. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you better not ask. <laughs> but you know, if, if you go with your, your arms and your eyes wide open, you'll, ha you'll have a wonderful time working internationally. Mm -hmm. But if you go with your mindset saying, okay, how can we do what we did at home here? That would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So in so many ways, it's kind of going back to beginner's mind and just being completely open, like, like we were when we were yeah. born, you know, babies and toddlers and just curious and open. Well, I recall in the last Chinese conference I was at in Shanghai, and I, I took out my Chinese-made cell phone, very cheap. Uh, I'm not an iPhone person. And... The Chinese colleagues, fundraisers, looked at it and started laughing because I had things like Facebook or WhatsApp. And they were so old-fashioned, so, <laughs> like, historical. I could have taken out a typewriter and they would have found it <laughs> modern. Because in China and, and in South Korea, they live in such a digital world. They do everything digital that... You know, they, they come to, to the U.S. or they come to Europe and they go, really? I have to do that with a credit card? Why does anybody have a credit card? All the payment mechanisms are in the phone, you know. Social media, my shopping, my banking, it's, it's all interconnected in one app, you know. And they used to think, aha. So that's why they get millions upon, well, billions, in fact, in micro donations every night. Wow. They don't get that in the West. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, you're really bringing to mind, if I am curious, if I'm interested in exploring a career in international fundraising, you know, not only do I need to really evaluate or consider like what it would be like to live in that space, what the cultural differences are, the wonderful things I can learn, the things that I may have to give up attachment to, like yeah. any of the examples that you gave, but also really looking at and doing my homework on what are the tools and the trends and the best practices and the emerging practices in that country related to raising money, telling the story. Mm -hmm. So we really have to go to those websites. We have to ask questions in those exploratory conversations about well, what technology do you use? How do you... And maybe even talk about how the tools you use, they use to reach certain donor segments. Absolutely. In fact, when we, you know, if, if as take Concern Worldwide, an Irish charity based in Dublin, hugely successful in Ireland, they wanted to go international pretty much, and to be fair to them, they had pretty much dominated the Irish fundraising market. They wanted to go to South Korea. They had nobody who'd ever even been to South Korea. But when they went to South Korea... As, as of many organizations, one of the most incredible fundraising nations on the planet, we don't go there thinking, what can they put from Ireland into South Korea? Our team is always, we interview the top 20 South Korean nonprofits and ask what they're doing, how their results are, what's working, what's not working. And people may not know, World Vision was founded in South Korea. It's not an American nonprofit. It's a South Korean nonprofit that went international. Did you know that? Wow. I did it's not know that. Dollars. Yeah. Yeah. People don't know that Plan International was actually originally founded in Spain during the Civil War to deal with orphan kids from the Civil War. 
When we worked with Oxfam to take Oxfam into South Korea, where they hadn't been fundraising before, in the process, we found a photograph of Oxfam raising funds in South Korea in 1958. A photograph of, of a fundraising event in South Korea. Wow. So, even, so, so quite often, um, you surprise yourself. But what I always, yeah, when people say, oh, it won't work here, because it's not invented here, I go, you have no idea where fundraising was invented. Mm -hmm. The Romans were doing fundraising. The, the medieval cathedral builders were doing fundraising. The face-to-face -face fundraising, which is street fundraising, signing up, the biggest fundraising tool on the planet by far in terms of numbers of donors recruited yes. and money raised from China to Chile, was invented in Austria by my team for Greenpeace at the time. But, Incredible. And hence we celebrate we celebrate face-to-face. -face. We're about to our third online conference coming out of Austria. And, uh, you know, so often people assume invented here, but in fact it was invented centuries before sometimes. Yes. yes, and I think that it's really dangerous to generalize, but I think that we in the United States, we feel like we invented fundraising, <laughs> that philanthropy is something that, we, 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 you know, we do it well. And so sometimes we, the most recent Giving USA data shows that we, you know, Americans gave more than $485 billion. billion. Yes. Yes. And so but we think that we, the, the, exactly, exactly. But it doesn't mean that we necessarily, like what we do here would work somewhere else or what's working somewhere else wouldn't work here. I think that there can easily, if we're not careful, be almost a bit of arrogance about fundraising in the United States. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be sensitive to our, little, our... I'm going to tell you a little <laughs> anecdote. And I'm speaking now as the former vice, vice chair of the AFP, the Association of Fundraising Pressure. I was the former yes. vice chair, former board member, so I'm very supportive, of course. I went to my first AFP, which was the NSFRE conference, I think in... 1994 in Chicago, Hilton and Towers. There was only one session on international fundraising, and we were 20 people, I think, from Greenpeace around the world at that conference. And do you know what the title of that session was? International Fundraising slash Good Old Yankee Know-How. Oh. <laughs> so you had to go just out of curiosity. Long. Uh, yes. We went, we went and closed it down and ran a, a free house open session, self-generating con session with a whole bunch of other people because we were not willing to listen to good old Yankee know-how. Of love course you did. That's awesome. Know -how. Brilliant direct mail in those times. Amazing major gift fundraising. But international fundraising, please. <laughs> no. Mm. You know, speaking of... Don't worry. Yes, yes. Thank, thankfully. Speaking of conferences, Daryl, you have been such an important voice and leader with the Resource Alliance. And for any of our listeners just who might... CEO, actually, literally, just before this call, I, turned, I said, Villica, I've got to go because I'm on a call with Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so very, very, yeah, very involved. And so I'll just say for any of our listeners who might not be familiar with the Resource Alliance, their mission is to foster and support collaboration within the global social impact sector. So they convene educational and leadership training opportunities for non the nonprofit sector. And one of those educational opportunities is coming up in October. It's October 18th through the 21st. And it's the um, their International Fundraising Conference in Holland, better known as IFC. Um, and this will be the first time they've hosted the conference since the pandemic began in 2020. So, Daryl, tell us a bit about one of my favorite conferences, IFC. Well, this year is the 40th year. Mm. So it's a very special year for the IFC. It's my 34th year attending the IFC. <laughs> so that shows to you how passionate and committed I am as a speaker, sponsor, uh, volunteer member of helping raise the mon money that uh, saved it from going under. For me, it is still the greatest fundraising conference in the world. Why? Because 65 
countries attend that conference. The global leadership typically of the biggest nonprofits in the international world, the Red Cross, the Save the Children, Oxfam, da, 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 you name it all, they are there. But also unusually for such a big conference, and it's, we're capping it this year at 650, but it goes up to 1100 on the non-post-COVID year, is it's residential. And it's residential for some of us from Monday through Friday for Masterclass uh, Tuesday through Friday and for the rest Wednesday through Friday. But everybody is living, eating, breathing. If you get up early enough, you can join me in the swimming pool, free <laughs> breakfast, and keeping the bar open very late. And that is like a Petri dish, an international Petri dish for fundraising. <laughs> I love that description. We are literally germinating and culminating and creating ideas and celebrating our profession there. And nobody disappears off to a bar down the road because all there is are tulips all around us. <laughs> Not tulip fields. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I've attended three times and spoken once, and I agree with you. It is extraordinary. I think it is truly international. And of course, it's, as Daryl described, it's um, hosted at the Norgewick Conference Center, which does have sleeping accommodations. It's very close to the North Sea and about 45 minutes outside of Amsterdam. So A, it's an amazing trip. B, it's an amazing conference. And I encourage every fundraiser to find a way to get there at least once. And what I promise you is right. if you go once, you'll want to go again. Absolutely. So, and there are bursaries. Yeah. So, so, so look out for a bursary. Or, or there are speaking opportunities and volunteer opportunities. So yes. many people get there the first time as a volunteer and they end up yeah. being speakers. And Amazing. Get there. It is really a life-changing organization. Yes, agreed. And so we'll include a link to IFC as well as a link to, you know, Daryl's uh, sites, both his con uh, Daryl Upsell Consulting and Daryl Upsell uh, Recruiting. We'll include all of those links in the show notes so that everyone can go and learn more. Um, Daryl, at the end of each of these episodes, I'd like to ask a few rapid fire questions to give a little bit of extra value to our listeners. So are you ready for some rapid fire? I'm ready. Okay, first question. What has been the best fundraising or development advice you've ever been given? Ignore anybody that says it won't work here. Mm, I love that. Beautiful. I'm, I'm actually going to put that on a post-it note and put it up in my office. That's beautiful. And here can be anywhere. It can be country, place, organization, you name it. Mm -hmm. Ignore it. It will. <laughs> Ignore it. What book do you recommend to our audience and why? I, I have no hesitation. It's Relationship Fundraising by Ken Burnett. Mm. And it was the first, it's the biggest selling fundraising book in history. And my good friend Ken wrote it quite early. You might find me quoted in there. I think it started in the late 80s even. And it was the first book that really focused on the donor, not the process. And it was all about listening to the donor and creating a relationship, lifetime value. It's a beautiful book, and if you read that, you'll read the second one. I agree. I totally agree. And in fact, Ken was a guest on this podcast, so if you want to learn more about Ken and hear from him firsthand, go back into uh, go back a few months, a couple months in the podcast and listen to that episode. Download it. So good. I love that book. That book is so full of post-it notes that it, it, it probably more as many post-it notes as there are pages. It's ridiculous. Absolutely. Daryl, what are the top three characteristics one needs to be successful as a fundraiser? Bold, open-minded, and hardworking. Yes, love that. What's your favorite fundraising tool or application? We know WhatsApp is one of them. The brain. A br <laughs> yes. Best tool. A brain. Sorry. The yeah. brain coupled with imagination coupled mm. with a vision, but it all comes from the brain. Love it. Your favorite fundraising conference and why? Hmm. Wonder what that might be. IFC, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 
sounds uh, very consistent. And last question, knowing what you know now about fundraising, what advice would you give your younger self or someone who's just getting started in the profession? My own very younger self, when I was probably 10 or 11, created my own motto, which is nothing is impossible. Mm. And I stick with that. And I had the honor of working with one of the greatest heroes of the 20th century, Mr. Nelson Mandela. I, I was his fundraiser. And he said, thing is impossible until it's done. And I think yes. that says it. In other words, you could say it's impossible and then just do it. And yes. That's what he did. Oh, I love that. One of my all-time favorite uh, autobiographies was his book, Long Walk to Freedom. Ah, Long Road to Freedom. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. so beautiful. It makes me laugh, makes me cry. And when he hugged me, I cried, I have to say. <laughs> mm, I would too. I, I mean, I'm actually <laughs> tearing up thinking about you and he hugging. It's beautiful. Oh, Daryl, I, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom on going international. I just want to remind everyone to ignore anyone who says it won't work here and that nothing is impossible. So if you want to learn more about Daryl and his work, check out his website, DarylUpsell.com. That's Daryl with one L and Upsell with two L's. We'll include the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast. Daryl, any parting words for us? Be brave. Just go for it. Be brave. Just go for it. And I'll add, keep on transforming your fundraising so you can transform the world. We'll see you next time. We're back for a final word about Tammy Zonker's training style and what you can expect when you join as a growth member in her Fundraising Transformers community. Here's growth member Jenna Sapluski from the Coalition for Children, Youth, and Families in Milwaukee. Tammy is so encouraging. She's very empowering. She really wants you to succeed in your role. And that really comes through with everything that she does from the monthly coaching calls to the monthly webinars. The guidance I've received from Tammy and other members of the Fundraising Transformers group has always been so constructive, so beneficial. And you can tell everyone in the group wants everybody else to succeed because we all know what a challenging job it can be to fundraise for our, our wonderful causes and our organizations. You may be asking yourself, can a growth membership really help me improve my fundraising results? Is it worth my time? Laurel Grow from Phoenix Family in Kansas City shared that her organization increased charitable dollars raised by 132% since joining as a growth member. Becky Shambliss from Awake in Anchorage, Alaska shared that her organization increased donor retention from 13% to 69% in about a year using what they learned from Tammy's training. And growth member Amanda Johnson from Multiplying Good in Indianapolis shared that her organization exceeded their annual fundraising goal by 104% and grew overall giving by 13% in one year by applying lessons learned from Tammy as a member of her Fundraising Transformers community. Here's member Stevie Shumate again sharing how she and you can grow your fundraising skills as a growth member of Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community. This is the first fundraising role that I have ever been in before. Um, so at 30 years old, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, well, how do I rocket launch my fundraising expertise? You learn from Tammy Zonker. That's what you do. Become a member of the Fundraising Transformers community. To join our live monthly training and Ask Me Anything sessions and get access to our growing library of on-demand training videos and tools and share lessons learned with other fundraising pros like you in our private and safe online community, visit fundraisingtransform.com growth, click join, and get started today. That's it for this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast. If you like this podcast, subscribe and download each episode on your favorite podcast platform. Share it on social media with the hashtag The Intentional Fundraiser and tag me, Tammy Zonker, and you'll be entered into a drawing for some great swag, books, and courses. And if you like today's show, you might also be interested in becoming a member of my Fundraising Transformer 
community where I go live twice a month with my members with fundraising training and group coaching to help transform those fundraising issues that keep you awake at night, where I pull back the curtain on how you can take your fundraising results to the next level by teaching ways you can improve your development operations, create a results-driven, donor-centric development plan, strengthen donor relationships, improve your donor retention rates, and build a raging monthly giving program and a successful major gifts program, and how you can approach each day to ensure you'll perform at your highest level so you can be the best fundraiser and the best person you can possibly be. Thank you for showing up and for having the courage and determination to to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. Bye for now.